Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Victoria, and thank you for coming to my talk, where I'll be basically talking about um, all the work that we've done behind the scenes to make Boyfriend Dungeon a success. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm the community developer at Kit Fox Games. Talk more about that later. Previously, I've worked on a bunch of other games. I've been a community consultant slash social media person for a bunch of games like Omen Sight, Leap of Fate, and more. Um, I have been trying every bubble tea place in San Francisco. It's almost disgusting, but that's okay. And I'm also half of a thing called Peach Butt Comics, which is a game development comic about like the culture of video games and making it from the game developer side. And that's on Twitter if you're interested. And of course, you can also find me on Twitter at the VTran. I'm there, shenanigans everywhere. Uh, yeah, so Kitbox. So Kitbox is a small, independent Montreal indie studio. We're a team of eight, and we've made um, quite a few games. We've been around for six years. Uh, our most popular, I guess, developed game that's out so far is Moon Hunters. We call that our personality test RPG. That was also a Kickstarter, which I'll be also talking about later. Uh, you've maybe heard of Boyfriend Dungeon, which I will delve into. And we've also kind of like dipped our toes into publishing and we'll be publishing Six Ages, which is the uh, spiritual successor to King of Dragon Pass and the legendary Dwarf Fortress onto Steam, which is very exciting. Uh, you'll see also on the photo there, that so the five people there, which includes me, uh, we're the development team behind uh, Boyfriend Dungeon. So it's only a team of five, so there's some things that happen there, and the rest of the Kit Foxes are great, uh, but they're not part of Boyfriend Dungeon. Sorry, they're also wonderful. Um, but I just wanted to point out those uh, that kind of little group because uh, this Kickstarter was not just me. It was the work of many people, including consultants, and a lot of help, and I just wanted to make sure that you know that it's their work too. Okay, so Boyfriend Dungeon. If you don't know, Boyfriend Dungeon is a dating simulator dungeon crawler uh, mashup where your weapons turn into beautiful people, and you take them out on dates, and that makes them stronger in the dungeon. Uh, it has male, female, non-binary romance. It was wonderful, and you're probably here because you heard about our Kickstarter. Uh, our Kickstarter went pretty well. Uh, in just over six hours, we reached our $65,000 goal. Uh, that was wild, and I was not prepared. And in the end, we ended up being funded for like $272,000. Again, wild and amazing. Uh, and I kind of just want to talk about all the success that we, like all the success we found and how we did it. Um, so the first step is actually just to have a good game, like have a good idea, uh, post it, and then you will profit. Thank you for coming, you can all leave now. <laughs> Obviously, this is not what happened. Uh, this was not an instant success, but the thing is, from the outside, it definitely looked like it, right? So this was our announcement tweet. Obviously, impressions doesn't necessarily mean everything, but it's just to give you a sense of how big it became. We almost got a million impressions. When we first announced it, it got viral got 50,000 engagement, uh, 50,000 total engagements. And then when we announced the Kickstarter, and this is again just a Twitter because this is mainly our focus in terms of community, it also went viral again. And it just basically looked like it blew up. We had a huge like following, et cetera. We also got news coverage from some of the biggest gaming news sites and then some, like some general entertainment ones like GQ. Um, and it basically felt like it blew up and it was everywhere. Uh, some people asked me if we paid for reviews and got like ad space and stuff and I can assure you we didn't because I get a grand total of zero dollars for my marketing budget. And you know, it's just like something's invisible until it's suddenly visible and there's nothing in between and it's really hard to kind of unpack that. So what I'll be talking about is all the stuff we've done to try and set it up for success. And this is all the invisible behind the scenes work that the team put into Boyfriend Dungeon that people don't usually hear about. Uh, we didn't know if it would work, to be clear. You can know all the stats and all the best practices, but there's no guarantee. If someone guarantees you that it's gonna go viral, don't trust them. I mean, or trust them. I'm not gonna run your life. <laughs> so Kit Fox has released three games and has announced three more. And what I want to talk about is what we found to be consistently useful in getting some form of attention across all our games of varying genres and themes. So this is the agenda, uh, with a focus on getting noticed first and foremost, hence the title, um, and basically making sure people hear about your game. Uh, maybe you'll find it useful, and maybe the stats I show you will help you gauge your own levels of success and what that means. All right, 
So the first thing that I find the most important is basically the hook. Uh, it doesn't matter how good your game is if literally no one finds out about it, which is unfortunate. Uh, there's already been a lot of great introductory resources on like various marketing aspects, like growing social media, creating a press list, et cetera. I can't talk about that. We'll, we're moving on from that. Um, one thing that continues to be the most successful parts of Boyfriend Dungeon are its hooks. Hooks are basically things that grabs a person's attention into learning more about your game. Uh, there can be multiple different ones. There's like the description, uh, there's the art, et cetera. We'll be talking about that. But the best ones are the ones that create an emotional like level of uh, connection to them. So ideally, how long do you have to take, how long do you have to capture a person's attention? Uh, two seconds. That's however long it takes to scroll past you on Twitter, see you on the upcoming games on Steam, et cetera. And what you have to interest them in these two seconds is tell them like you want to learn more. Ideally, give them some idea of what the game is about and stand out from the hundreds of other games that are being released every single day. So I'm going to quickly break down uh, Boyfriend Dungeon's hook by giving you a glimpse at how we built the Steam page. I'm using Steam instead of Kickstarter because I figure mo more of you will have that than a Kickstarter page, but you know, who knows. Uh, so the first one is the title. Of course, this is really difficult, and you want a title that uh, has good SEO, so when you Google it, it doesn't autocorrect to something else, and it doesn't sort like, you don't find another more popular thing. Like if you named your, I don't know, your game Google, don't do that. That's a bad, that's bad SEO. <laughs> um, we also have uh, the trailer, which of course isn't playing, but you know, this is one of the biggest pulls in terms of hooks. Uh, visually, games, that's what a lot of games are about, and of course games do well without, visual, like, without great visuals, but it is a really easy way to grab someone's attention and kind of form that emotional connection. Uh, we had a tagline called Romance Your Swords, and this is really good because you usually want a one-sentence description that anyone can say, anyone who isn't in games and is in games can understand and kind of draws that emotional reaction. Um, Shack and Slash is a really bad pun, and I'm very proud of it. And it's also a pun that, like, puns are actually great hooks because, you know, again, you have that, like, kind of guttural feeling of either, like, this is the best thing in the world or this is the worst thing in the world. Um, genre can be a really good hook. For us, it was dating sim dungeon crawler. Could be different for anyone. And of course, the Steam capsules themselves are really important for when people are scrolling through. Again, this is just a really brief overview. So one of the hardest hooks I think to nail is the description of your game. Uh, I wanna talk about it here because I find that's the one people most struggle with. So my question to you is what game is this? It's a fast-paced 2D action adventure with challenging combat, a rich story, and gorgeous art. It's actually Boyfriend Dungeon. It might also be Hollow Knight. It could possibly be Dead Cells. It might be The Messenger. But my point is, it's really easy to put a game in there. So my favorite thing to do when I'm creating a game hook description is to remove your game name and all other like nouns uh, from the description. Replace it with a game that's a competitor or maybe similar to yours and figure out if it's basically indistinguishable. If it is, then you need a better hook. If you need some help making something unique, take out everything you would usually use to describe your game and try to, to describe it again without these words. For example, don't use the word story-driven, don't use puzzle, don't use narrative, don't use mystery, action, metroidvania. Please don't use fast-paced. I've seen the word fast-paced in so many games and it's, it means nothing to me now. <laughs> but does it still sound interesting enough to play, right? So all of these descriptions that I've put on the screen uh, these are all like these are from the games themselves, and I just basically just remove like words from them, and it still sounds really interesting, right? You would still understand the game. Any normal person on the street could probably repeat it and kind of understand what it's about. Essentially, your hook needs to elicit some sort of strong emotional reaction. This can be good or bad, and it's not necessarily informative about the game. This is why cinematic trailers can still work, and even if they tell you nothing about the game, as long as you embed a feeling in the player when they read about it, even before they start playing. And oftentimes, what the team finds most technically interesting doesn't translate well to what ge the general public is interested in, though that can depend on your demographic. So every game is different, and different hooks have different values. So for instance, procedurally generated might be good in one respect, or maybe if you're trying to describe it to a more general audience, you can just say it's different every time. Um, in a similar vein, know what not to say about your game. 
This prevents disappointment or narrow assumptions of your game. For example, we, didn't, we don't define Boyfriend Dungeon as a visual novel because that kind of feels like it erases the fact that there's any dungeon crawling at all. Um, we use the word dating sim because it feels more like interactive, a little bit more gameplay, that kind of thing. Um, it's also important to know your key differentiators. Uh, this is via market research done ages before you even start prototyping your game. You have to see if your hook has already been used or if it, a similar hook has been already used, and if so, why it did or did not work. And remember, not all hooks apply to all games equally. Definitely a narrative game values things differently than a shooter. You just have to really find yours and do the market research. So note that with hook strategies, this doesn't describe a small aspect of your game. It should actually be core to your gameplay, right? Like we do actually have dating simulators and dungeon crawler mashed up together and that's the entire game. Again though, hooks come in different forms such as cinematics or art and we had previously announced Boyfriend Dungeon uh, you know, in, this, in its existence way before we did the Kickstarter. I think we announced it existed in October 2017, and the Kickstarter was in August 2018. So we knew for the campaign we would need something really fresh and exciting uh, to show things off and you know, get that explosive reaction that we wanted from the crowd. So we put a lot of work into <laughs> creating this transformation sequence uh, that we got from Particle Beam. Um, it paid 10 times over for sure, and in, in, in addition to all the original music. It's an example of knowing what your audience wants and trying to you know, get that emotional uh, level from them, and it elevates the game's look, polish, and helps people literally understand what the game is about when we say your weapons transform into people. <laughs> um, but this takes so long. It takes forever, and that's okay. The best descriptions are ones that everyday people can repeat themselves and it's memorable. Take the time for it and make sure it works. You know, and you can practice it. The best places are at conventions when you're pitching your game. Um, the longer it takes for you to pitch your game, probably the shorter you need to make it. Okay, so now that you've solidified your general impressions on the community at large, it still matters what, uh, that you think of kind of different hooks when you're contacting press, whether they're content creators or journalists. Uh, why? So I asked one of my game journalist friends to send me a screenshot of their inbox. Uh, they write for a very large games outlet and they don't write full time for this, so keep in mind this is like a part time journalist. Uh, this is from their review codes folder, which specifically picks out emails with certain keywords. So there could be more in their general inbox. If you check the dates, they get at least two press emails per day. And here's even more of their inbox with even more press emails. And here's another. Uh, I got tired of blurring out information, so I just blurred out the entire thing here. Um, but the point is, there's a lot of emails. And when you email press, you better have something newsworthy to tell them. Uh, we, strateg we strategically made sure never to show or tell uh, certain aspects about our game until it was time to announce it to the press. Again, there's a lot of resources on how to write a good email, but I want to stress a good title may be more important than what's actually inside the body of the email. So in this case, the outside counts more than the inside, and I'm sorry, but that's how it is. Because after all, if they don't even click your email, it doesn't matter what's inside. Personalizing and figuring out what press people like will be beneficial here. The first email title is one that I sent to a general press member that I'm not really close to. The second one is one that I've talked to on Twitter and I realized they really like butts. It worked, they replied. <laughs> and, you know, for, and this changes depending on whatever uh, news outlet you're talking to or the people you're talking to. Um, for example, this is uh, Dwarf Fortresses when this is, I think I sent this last week almost. Um, and this was an email I sent to people who might have not necessarily known who, what Dwarf Fortress was. And you need to know like, you know, kind of what's really interesting about your game in order to properly email the press. And you know, Kickstarters by themselves aren't newsworthy. Uh, when we emailed press about our game, we barely even mentioned the Kickstarter. Uh, the whole marketing beat was the fact that we had a new trailer with the cat at the forefront. And why the cat? Because the glimpse of the cat during conventions when we showed off the trailer actually got the biggest emotional response. Like people just asked, was that a cat? Um, so when we decided to email press, uh, we basically just put the cat in there. And yeah, I kept track of every single comment that we got in our trailer, and this is why you really want to pay attention to what people are talking about. 
So if you nailed the an announcement and press contacts, that's not what the entire marketing thing is about, right? You have to keep people interested so that by the time your game actually releases or the mid-campaign slump comes around, you have something for it. Um, being a team of five on Boyfriend Dungeon means we often had limited resources or found we couldn't do everything that would be considered best practices. And my full-time job is to do the best practices. I had no time. Uh, so that's where the community helps. So we're not big forum people, so usually I can't, I'm really bad at posting on Reddit and Reset Era and all those things. I'm sorry if I'm a failure of a community manager there, but it's okay because that's where the community steps in. Community and social media are helpful catalysts in increasing your chances of being noticed. A strong community approach means they'll reach more places you'll never be able to even think of and give them opportunity. And also, if you give them opportunities to help you, uh, you can be honest and they will want to help. Um, but let's be clear about one thing though, social media is not just about memes. Uh, social is helpful as a compass to direct your community and signal what's so cool about your game and without them having to read entire articles about it because let's be real here, not everyone does that. And it's also great for word of mouth, which is way better than any marketing you can ever do. So when you find those people that are willing to help, make sure that you reward them and you pay attention because they will be your fans for life and it's great. Okay. So let's talk about some Kickstarter optimizations we did to try and get more people to kind of notice us. So even when the Kickstarter itself launched, we had certain techniques to help increase the hype or make it more exciting to people who uh, wanted to back the game. So one of the things that we found really good was actually the limited time early bird instead of like a limited number early bird. Uh, we made it under a 24-hour limit. Psychology-wise, people tend to want to back a Kickstarter that looks like it's close to being funded or already funded, which sucks in its own way, but that's how it works. So you want to basically try to have the most hype near the beginning and get as much funding as possible because that will really incentivize people to back you. Uh, we also had hidden stretch goals. This made it an exciting piece of news to look forward to, and it meant every time we announced a new stretch goal, uh, it was its own newsworthy piece. For goal, fun goals actually turned out to be pretty good too, not necessarily because it motivated people to fund us, but it would actually spawn just nice inside jokes and kind of like a community sense uh, for those that followed the Kickstarter. And of course, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of stuff that didn't work out, because I think that's really important. Um, when we, review, we revealed stretch goal costs too early, uh, when we announced our stretch goals, they were secret, but we announced the cost up front. And we should have kept that hidden in order to account for any changes that would come up later, and they did. Um, and another thing that, in relation to the money thing, is that we tried to price in American, so USD. We should have priced it in Canadian. <sighs> we thought pricing it from a USD standpoint would be better since most of our backers came from America. But since we're Canadian, it actually ended up uh, making our numbers look super strange. And due to currency fluctuations, sometimes our Canadian goal would be reached, but our USD one wouldn't. And it made for some really confusing moments where backers weren't sure if they got the stretch goals or not. But that's okay. Um, we also went to PAX West during the campaign. Um, and I d we didn't actually see a huge spike from going to a convention in the middle of the campaign, though we did meet a bun bunch of passionate fans and we got more press coverage than we ever did before, which probably helped our our visibility a few days before the dates of you know it ending. Um, but again, not too much in terms of money, so who knows. Um, Add-ons, uh, we didn't do any of those because we wanted this Kickstarter to be as straightforward as possible for us. Um, I've heard of a lot of uh, devs that you know did make more money because they had add-ons, but also it was a bigger headache, so you pick and choose what you want. And we also had no console goals. And I believe we would have had more money, again, if we did stretch goals for consoles, perhaps. But um, I don't know. It just it, We didn't want to make any mistakes with porting, and we wanted to work on the base game. So again, kind of pick and choose what you like. And, a, and we also didn't have like a $1 pledge tier with no reward. Uh, we thought that would create an anchoring effect, which basically means that people, when they see the rest of the stretch goals, they wouldn't want to kind of back it at a higher price point. Okay, so just a quick note. Uh, it isn't just about being noticed, as much as that is important. Impressions mean nothing without engagement. So your game needs to have some actual weight to it. Different games may need different value points or gain trust and legitimacy in different ways. Either way, if you're a new developer on Kickstarter, know that emphasizing this has weight and value. So Boyfriend Dungeon in particular had a lot of people asking if it was just a gimmick. And this makes sense, right? It's kind of a silly game premise. Um, 
and it, they wanted to know if we made this just because we knew it would have a strong, like, oh, like emotional reaction, we're going to be viral, and then we would disappear and fade off into the distance. So we had to spend a lot of time increasing our trust and like, legitimacy to the community, whether that was through pointing out our previous games or accepting any and all interviews about knowledge, sharing our own knowledge, and other games, for example, like 2D platformers, might have the opposite problem. Uh, you might need to prove why your game is so unique and special and different from the other 2D platformers. All right, so how did our noticing efforts go, considering the Kickstarter campaign in particular? Uh, this is a super quick rundown of how our campaign went, with all things considered. Uh, Mid-campaign, we were averaging about four to $6,000 a day, which is great, since normally you think we would have fetched uh, Saturated, saturated our niche after the first day. Uh, but word of mouth kept going, and we kept pushing, so that was wonderful. Um, here is a very large graph of our top 10 referrals, uh, or in other words, the places that converted the most people into pledges. What I want to point out is actually our Twitter, which was very strange, because according to our Kickstarter contact, the conversion rate for Twitter, uh, which is the percent of pledge column, is usually less than 1% for video games. Our Twitter alone accounts for 17%, which is cool. You know, that's where we put a lot of our efforts into, so it was nice that it turned out that way. And Warfin Dungeon in particular is very community-oriented. Um, in comparison to our previous Kickstarter with Moon Hunters, uh, it did way better in terms of like social aspects. So here's a comparison. Moon Hunters Kickstarter was in 2014, and this was kind of before we were really building our community, so we only had like 12.5% making up uh, the grand total of referrals, and Boyfriend Dungeon is almost twice that at 23.28%, so that was really nice. Uh, and the most popular times that people visited our Kickstarter page but didn't necessarily back it was obviously in the beginning, which is very cool. A fast drop down because likely a lot of people saw it, et cetera, it went viral during that time. Uh, but there's a little spike on August 23rd because we were featured on the front page of the Kickstarter website, uh, so that's really nice to see. And of course, there's a tiny spike near the end when people come in to check to see if your uh, Kickstarter looks like it's going to be funded or not, and then they decide to throw in their money. Uh, and they also get like a little email reminding them to back the game from Kickstarter if they are following it. And here's our social growth for the campaign. On the right were the call to actions near the top of our page, and the ones with stars next to them mean uh, they weren't directly linked on the page. Um, personally, I think having social links near the top is extremely important. Chances are no one is going to read your entire page. Even I struggle to read our entire page <laughs> and keep up with your updates, et cetera. So, keeping, so getting them on a quick and easy platform that they check often is important. Um, and know which ones you can promote the most, by the way. It doesn't, I didn't put Facebook and Tumblr on there because I knew I didn't have the time for them. Um, but Twitter, the newsletter, and Discord were really important to us. So you want to know where your like, quality audience is. All right, so we have some last minute tips before I wrap up. Uh, look at failure and learn from them. Often these are the ones that, often the ones that make it like ours have a lot of survivorship bias and you can learn a lot from failure. Um, we only improved parts of the Boyfriend Dungeon game uh, that, needed it, that needed to be shown. Literally, the rest of the game was super broken. And it worked because everyone thought it looked really cool and we, we were really ready. And then someone thought that we could make the game in six months, and we could not. I'm so sorry, random Reddit person. Um, get brutal feedback. Like, seriously, um, set up an anonymous feedback form if you really have to. Uh, get, like, because you can show your Kickstarter page beforehand to, you know, some other game developers maybe who have done it before, it's really valuable, it really puts things into perspective, but eventually it's your call, you know your game the best. And of course, don't forget people don't read and have very little patience, so you, again, you want that emotional reaction from everything. So it's a lot of work if you're doing Kickstarter, uh, good luck, but I'm sure you can do it. Make sure to get some rest, you're going to be okay. That's discoverability. Thank you. <laughs> cool. And I think we're doing questions now, if people have them. Don't ask hard questions, please. <laughs> or no questions. So, oh, how yes, many, so how many followers did you have across your social media things before you started the Kickstarter? Yeah, uh, before the Kickstarter or before the announcement? 
Sorry, I didn't catch it. Both? Either one. Yeah. Either one. Okay. Uh, so the question was, how many followers do we have before we announced, I guess, the Kickstarter or we announced Boyfriend Dungeon? Um, before we announced Boyfriend Dungeon, I believe we were at 7,000 Twitter followers and um, Facebook was like 2,000. 500 maybe. I don't post on Facebook often. I don't like Facebook. Sorry. Um, and then during the Kickstarter, we had just less than 10K followers. So yeah, it's, we definitely had a sizable community. Um, and we also had been building up our newsletter at every convention. So that's really important, actually. Uh, newsletters are fantastic and will convert a lot of people. So basically, at any turning point we had, we would recruit people to social media or newsletters. Um, but yeah, I rambled. Are there no more questions? Are we good? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs>